Living Corporate is brought to you by the Liberated Love Notes podcast, part of the Living Corporate Network. The Liberated Love Notes podcast is a starting point for integrating self and community affirmations into your daily practices. The Liberated Love Notes podcast center the experience of black folks existing in white systems and speaks to overcoming imposter syndrome, disrupting injected and internalized forms of oppression, embodying an abundance mindset and building a healthy racial identity. Check out Liberated Love Notes podcast wherever you listen to podcasts hosted by Brittany Janae Harris. Hey, everybody, this is See It to Be It, the Wednesday podcast from Living Corporate. Living Corporate is a digital media network that centers and amplifies black and brown people at work. My name is Amy C. Wanninger, and I'm the host of See It to Be It. When I was growing up in rural southern Indiana, I didn't know people who went to college or who worked in professional roles. I didn't know what those jobs looked like, much less how to break into them. But this show isn't about me, it's about my guests. Every week, I bring you career stories from everyday role models in jobs you may not know exist. More importantly, the folks I interview share their perspectives as black and brown professionals in jobs and environments where they may be the only. My guest today is Vonda Page. She's my good friend. Uh, She's been interviewed on the show before, and she is back. She has just launched her own company, Radical Change LLC, and I cannot wait for you to hear from her. But before we get to the interview, we're going to tap in with Tristan for some career advice. What's going on, Living Corporate? It's Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. And this week, I'm not necessarily giving a tip, but I wanted to discuss the impact of authenticity during your job search and career. Most black and brown professionals are well aware of bias they may experience throughout the job search because somewhere down the line, we were taught that we needed to hide parts of ourselves to try and land the jobs we want. From whitening our resume by not using our real name to switching up the way we speak during interviews, we are always aware, sometimes consciously and sometimes not, that our race can and most likely has played a factor in hiring decisions. Recently, I had a black client who is a whole doctor ask me if she should use her real name on her resume for fear of how recruiters and hiring managers would view her. I had another black woman tell me that she didn't want to take a new headshot for LinkedIn right now because she had in braids and she didn't want potential employers to think that she was, quote, too ethnic. I had another black male client who asked me if highlighting his leadership with a professional black organization would decrease his chances of getting calls for interviews. These are the type of questions and comments I hear from many of my black clients, and I completely get their concerns. A 2016 study published in the Administrative Science Quarterly showed that 25% of black candidates received interview callbacks if their resumes were scrubbed of racial cues, whereas only 10% of black candidates got calls when they left ethnic details intact. The study even showed that you may be at an even greater risk for discrimination when applying to a pro-diversity employer because candidates tend to be more transparent. So the issue is very real and the tactics we've developed clearly produce results in getting us jobs. But I fear we may be setting ourselves up for a fairly tough work experience. The job search, interview, and even the first couple of days on the job are often times when you are laying the foundation of your relationship with the company and vice versa. When your foundation is based on the scrub version of you, I found that you tend to get boxed into that version. I've seen this lead to us feeling like we're not seen in the workplace or like we can't truly be ourselves at work, a place where we spend a large majority of our time. And when we decide it's time to show true pieces of ourselves, we start to get pushback from our colleagues and leadership that can take on many different forms, most typically having a negative impact on us. This produces an uncomfortable and at times unsafe work environment for us, which puts us in a position where we feel we have to leave a company even though we may like the work we're doing. So When my clients ask me if they should present themselves differently to land a role, it's always a hard question for me to answer because there's obviously risk on both sides. The data clearly shows the answer is yes. 
but the lived experiences show how detrimental shrinking yourself for a job can be. So I always pose the question, if a company rules you out because of your name, your natural hair, or your black organizational affiliations, or any other reason related to your race, is that really a company you want to work for? This episode was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume, or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. Living Corporate is brought to you by The Leadership Range, a podcast within the Living Corporate Network. Hosted by globally certified and Fortune 500 executive coach and leadership development expert Neil Edwards, The Leadership Range is focused on having real, raw, soulful, and accountable conversations about inclusive leadership, allyship, professional development. Every week is a new episode with new learning and new actions to take on to grow inclusively. Make sure you check out The Leadership Range everywhere you listen to podcasts. Welcome back to See It To Be It. My guest today is Vonda Page, and that name may sound familiar because she's been here before, but she has started a new endeavor, and I want to tell you a little bit about it before we introduce her officially. Vonda says, we love innovation and we hate change, even though the two are inextricably linked. Both are tied to our collective advancement. Leaders, especially in technology, need sound strategies and specific skills to erect the systems and structures necessary for true innovation to occur. Vonda helps busy leaders drive innovation in companies, organizations, schools, and communities so change doesn't suck. Welcome back to the show, Vonda. Thanks so much for having me, Amy. I'm excited to be here today. It is always a pleasure when I get to talk to you. So Vonda, you recently founded Radical Change LLC, which is based upon your life's work, basically, of helping people navigate change in technology and in the workplace. What prompted you to start your own company? I love this question, um, Amy, and thanks so much. So, you know, it's interesting because I've been a lifelong organizational change manager and a lifelong technologist, you know, I have had the opportunity to see how change works in companies. I've had the opportunity to see how leaders take on change endeavors. I've had the opportunity to see how change impacts, you know, teams, families, organizations, groups, and companies. And in 2020, the thing that really prompted me to say, I need to help people was the killing of George Floyd. And the thing that really got me, I think there was a couple of things that were all happening at the same time. So, you know, we were stuck in the house um, because of COVID. People were transitioning to just getting used to working remotely, right? And making that whole transition. We didn't know how long we were gonna be um, working from home and and away from the office. And while that was happening, the entire world saw a black man get murdered for nine minutes and, and 29 seconds. And something clicked in me that said that we have even a more dire need to help people understand change because people think of change as this big, you know, cumbersome, hard thing like, oh, I don't want to change. Uh, uh. That's why I say, you know, people love innovation, but they hate change. But change is inevitable. It is something that happens whether we want to take part in it or not. It's a process. And so when I saw like a culmination of all of these changes that were happening at one time. So, you know, employers trying to get used to helping people work from home employers and employees grappling with what does, you know, um, social justice look like, right? What does the Black Lives Matter movement even mean? How does that impact us at work in our personal lives and, and all around? And I knew that within, you know, a corporate structure that the capability to be able to put strategies and plans together wasn't going to necessarily fit. And I thought so long about, you know, how do I do the work that I want to do that is really going to have an impact? And I said, you know, there has to be a radical change, a radical shift in how we do things. And so I just, you know, came up with radical change. And that is the only way that things are going to happen, right? We know that little incremental changes, little incremental movements don't really solve big problems. We have a lot of big problems and I'm here to solve some of them. 
So let's talk about that. What problem are you hoping to help people solve? Well, the two problems that I really want to help people solve, one, number one, is I want to help leaders understand the struggle that they're having is really based in how they lead change. And so what that means is that, um, as I said, right, change is constantly occurring and there's nothing we can do about it, right? Whether we're talking about, you know, weather, whether we're talking about politics, it doesn't matter. Change is consistently happening. But what we can do is we can manage and lead the change. And knowing that the change is going to occur, we can take an active role in it and we can determine what we want the outcome to be. So when I think about, you know, issues regarding social justice, right? And most of us, and I know you and I, we talk about this, you know, we know that there are a lot of problems that really could be solved. However, leaders, decision makers are the ones that have the power, right? And the influence and the authority and the ability to make it happen. So the problem I'm solving is helping leaders really know how do you do this? How do you help your workplace transition or transform, whether you're talking about from uh, in the office to uh, work from home or a hybrid? There are certain skills and strategies that leaders need that I don't think they necessarily have. And I think the evidence of that is when you don't see progress, right, in a lot of problems that we know we've had for a long time. So in the tech industry, for example, right, a big issue that you hear people talk about is the lack of women representation in um, highly technical roles and in leadership roles. Well, we've had this information for 20 years, right? LinkedIn, Lean In, Accenture, right? All of these companies over the years, right, have done studies. McKinsey's done tons of studies, right, around what we need to do to make, you know, the tech space or corporate America more equitable and have more representation, not only of women, but of Black people, brown people, indigenous, you know, queer, gender non-conforming, whatever. But yet those things are not happening. And so what I believe is that it's fundamentally rooted into the leader who has the ability to make those decisions, to make those changes come forth. So what I want to do is help leaders really get down to the nitty gritty of the simple actions and things that they need to understand in order to do that. So the whole idea behind radical change is to, number one, I'm, I'm pioneering a, a change leadership revolution and helping people to look at change in a different way. But then secondarily, really helping leaders build up not only the skills that they need, but understand the strategy that they need in order to execute it. And really it's around creating an environment that is as suitable and helps change be more certain. Love that. And, you know, I, I talk a little bit about change um, as a leadership skill, not to the depth that you do, right? But I think it's so important if we give people a repeatable process to manage a situation, right? It doesn't matter what comes at them. They can put it through the process. They come out the other side with a solution. They come out the other side with a plan. They come out the other side, you know, feeling empowered. And it's all about giving them a process to work through. Why do you think though, without a process, why do you think this is so hard? Because nobody well, the, wants change, right? You talk, say, oh, we're going to change some things around here. And you see everybody like tighten up, right? People hate change. And, you know, I have been studying it for so long. So technically, I've been a technologist and change manager since 1984. And I would say probably since undergraduate and graduate is when I really started like digging into change and why is change so hard and why it does it just like suck for people, right? And there's all these conceptual, theoretical explanations, right? And there are tons of amazing change management organizations, right? Especially ProSci and ACMP, right? There's tons of them. And what I have boiled it down to is the reason that change is so hard is because of our personal biases, right? Now, we always talk about, we talk about bias. That's a hot topic nowadays, right? Like privilege and anti-racism. But when I say bias, I'm using bias as an acronym for our beliefs, our intentions, our attitudes, and our self-view. So 
when you think about human beings, right, and, and how we develop and evolve into who we are, you know, at a very young age, right, zero to five, our family of origin, meaning who we grow up in a house with, right, those beliefs that helps to shape who we are at the very beginning, right? So do we believe that, you know, all women should smile more, right? Do we believe that, I don't know, girls All are, tennis players are, should do press conferences. All tennis players should do press conferences, right? So how we form those beliefs, right, is a really big part of why change was up. Because if we have some deep down beliefs about something, then something that is counter to that belief is going to raise a red flag and pull up a challenge for us. So I think that's the first piece is based on our beliefs. I think the second is around our intentions. So, you know, once again, back to our families of origin and how we grow up, right? And you think about your intentions every day. So I grew up and I think I may have told you, I had a really rough childhood growing up. And so I grew up, you know, not being treated nice and kind, but my intent to everybody that I encounter. I want people to walk away from every interaction with me feeling good, right, about the interaction. So my intent when I'm going into a conversation, when I'm going into a situation, my intent is like for it to be good, right, for other people and hopefully for myself, but I think about other people. So I think intentions is the second piece. I think the third is our attitudes, right? Now, we might have certain beliefs, like, you know, all tennis players, um, especially if they're women, they should do press conferences. We might believe that, but our attitude to how we feel about that is different, right? Because we could say, well, absolutely right. All tennis players, that's what they're there. They're playing tennis. You know, they're making millions of dollars. They need to do these darn interviews, whether they feel like it, whether it, you know, impacts their mental health or the way they play in the future or whatever. If we have an attitude, right, that is so entrenched and so stringent, right, that it's another barrier, right, to how we're going to approach change when it comes. So then that fourth one is really the self view, right? So how do we see ourselves? How do we view who we are in the context of change. So I, you know, always look at change as an opportunity, right? And I look at the opportunity from the terms of change is going to happen anyway. Um, It's inevitable. And I know that I have the ability to roll with the change, to make the change better, or at the very least to make it not suck. But if you put them all together, like I said, your beliefs, right? The intentions that you have when you go into it, the whole attitude that you have, and then your self view. I believe that those are the reasons that change is so hard, but we can change all of that, right? You can change what you believe, right? Because hopefully now some people don't um, believe that all people that play tennis should be forced to do an interview, right? Whether they want to or not. You can change your intentions for conversations. You can change your intentions for outcomes. You can say, well, you know, instead of a person feeling, I don't know, intimidated or aggravated or upset, I want to make them feel calm. I want to make them feel welcomed. I want to make them feel comfortable. So you can intend, right? And then you can change your attitude. So even if things are rough, you can say, well, you know what? I'm going to choose to pick a new attitude, right? You know, um, there's a saying, I forgot who says it. Everyone has an attitude, pick a good one or something like that, right? So you can pick your attitude and then your self-view is something that you can work on. And that's where, for me, the learning piece comes in, right? And this is, you know, why change is so hard is because people, unfortunately, don't like to learn. And, you know, for me, that's almost crazy because I spend every day, I spend hours learning something because I feel like that's how I grow. And so for me, change doesn't suck. And I think that if I'm able to help people understand that they can change their own biases, intentions, attitudes, and self-view, that is one way that change doesn't have to suck. I love it. And I was going to ask you, what do you love about change? But it sounds like you are so entrenched in this growth mindset and just knowing you and having worked with you and, you know, kind of attached myself to you um, in an almost unhealthy way at this point, because I love you so much. That- <laughs> the feeling's totally mutual. 
<laughs> I mean, I know what it, what growth means to you, and I know what this constant learning cycle means to you. And I think when so I'm gonna I'm gonna answer what I think your answer is gonna be to the question I didn't ask, which is, you know, if you're constantly growing, you're constantly changing, but it's something you're embracing. It's not something you're struggling against. Right. Right. And that's the thing. If you embrace it as part of the inevitability of life, you just embrace it like it's going to happen. And so you can make the intention, right, that this change isn't going to be that hard. So I have a simple example, and I may have told you this before. So when I relocated, my daughter and I relocated from Delaware to Portland, we had lived in our house for seven years. And, you know, you wouldn't think that a girl, a woman, and a little 15-pound dog could compile and collect so much stuff in seven years. But when I tell you in our two-bedroom house, we had so much stuff. So I knew that I needed help because we're making this big change, moving across the country, and everything was going to be different. And so I reached out to an organizer because I didn't want the change to suck. And I know that I didn't have all of the tools and skills and things necessary to make a whole cross country move. I mean, I've moved, you know, from Philadelphia to Delaware, from Newark to Wilmington, you know, but not, you know, 2,900 miles. And so having a process, having a specific roadmap to follow for a cross country move made it suck much less. And it really didn't suck at all, except for waiting for my car to get here after I had already gotten here because that took, I don't know, like an extra six days or something, but it could have been terrible, right? I mean, I think about how we organized, you know, everything, we organized papers and pictures and what was going to get thrown away, what was going to be taken, how things were going to get transported. I mean, a move like that, it could have been huge. And I think about people who've lived in, you know, maybe like their childhood home for 18 years or 20 years, right? And then you finally move out. But I had such a optimistic attitude, right? I had such a belief that this change is going to be great. I had intended to make it as organized and as stress-free as possible. And, you know, personally, you know, from a self-view standpoint, I had the confidence that, hey, I'm moving to Oregon. It's going to be a new start, you know, beautiful trees everywhere, water you can drink right out of the tap, you know, what could be better? So I went into it with a really good attitude and a good feeling about it and everything's worked out. But if I think about it, it could have really been a disaster because I could have just, oh man, just threw stuff in a bag and, you know, in boxes and just kind of, but I, I wanted to do it in a way that was going to have a good end result. And I did it in a purposeful way so that I knew that that would happen. This notion of not everything gets to come with you and not everything should come with you, I think is powerful because we do accumulate beliefs and attitudes and self-limiting things over time, right? We accumulate these things. We don't know where they came from, but all of a sudden we look around and we're buried under them. And if we're going to move on, we need to get rid of some of that stuff, right? We need to make room for something fresh. We need to, you know, kind of declutter our mental space around this. Mm -hmm. And I I think that's such a great metaphor. And I tell people unlearn, you know, you can unlearn just like you learn. So my thing is unlearn things that aren't helpful, right? Like if it's not helpful, unlearn that. Even if something that you grew up believing, right? Because your family of origin believed one thing, right? I mean, there's people who believe black people shouldn't get the vote. You don't have to believe that even if you grew up, you know, with that belief, right? You can unlearn. And I think the process of unlearning happens through learning, right? And so learning about yourself, learning about other people, and that helps you to learn about the world. Yeah, I remember I, I'm going to just share real quick. I grew up, you know, I grew up very working class, right? Very white community, very working class. But I remember my parents would say things like, I love you, mom and dad. Don't, don't take this the wrong way. But I remember they would say things like, you know, the so-and-sos have a lot of money, but you'd never know it. They're really nice people. And I accumulated this lifetime of thinking that if somebody had a lot of money, 
they must not be a very nice person because my parents had to go out of their way to call out the exceptions to that rule. Right now, of course, there was the other end of that, which is, you know, so-and-so, you know, you know, they're so tight that they probably have the first penny they ever earn. So it was like this, this tight rope that was, the lines were never clearly defined, right? You have to have enough money, but not too much. And you have to spend enough money, but not too much. And I never understood where those guardrails were. Mm -hmm. And I'm finally realizing now at the tender age of 46, that all of these beliefs that I grew up with around money, right? They're, they've accumulated like old electric bills and, you know, books about things that I don't study anymore and, you know, toys I don't play with anymore, right? They're like weighing me down. Yes. And so I have to be able to like unlearn like, oh, I can create this whole new mental model around what this is supposed to look like. Yeah. And I can say, you know what? I don't have to be limited by these things I used to believe, or I, even if I don't even really fully understand where they came from, they were just, they were so amorphous, right? That I felt like, I felt like I was re- walking like a really narrow path with an electric fence on either side, mm-hmm. but I didn't know where the path was and it was in the dark. Mm-hmm. And so I was mm-hmm. just sure that either way I was going to step in something, right? You don't, you don't operate very well from a place of fear. Right. And so it wasn't until I kind of realized all of this, like, oh, this is why I struggle with this. This is why I have these beliefs. This is why that I was able to kind of untangle it, sort it out, learn something new and kind of get rid of some of this clutter, you know, that's kind of been there. Right. But you did the work, but you did the work because something clicked in you. Right. Right. It's because something clicked in you like you and you asked yourself those questions like, huh, why did that? Why do I believe that? Or why, you know, are people that have money, are they mean? Are they dumb? Are they, you know, to think through it, right? Is that act of learning why you have specific beliefs, right? And then unlearning things that aren't helpful and that don't make sense. And and so I think a lot of times, especially the more responsibility we have, right? As a leader, you know, as a person, our family community, the more responsibility we have, we have so many other things happening, right? that we don't take the time to do that evaluation, that examination and ask ourselves those questions, right? And so when I think about, you know, the type of environment that helps people be able to think about change, right? In a way that it it doesn't have to be painful. It it doesn't have to suck. What I've learned is that there's really, I call them seven certainties, right? Things that you can put into place And when all of these things are here, it makes change suck less, less, less and less. So the first one I talk about is culture, right? So meaning what is the the culture of change or the culture in which you're operating? So if you're a manager of, you know, a team of 30 people, what does that culture look like? Is it a culture of, you know, hey, we're all on one team. We all work together. We all have clear communication. You know, we respect each other's boundaries, you know, and we're, you know, we, we all are thinking um, on the same page and we're part of the same team. So is your culture that you're in, right, one that, that's going to help advance that? So if you're in a, a culture, like take back to, you know, your time growing up, right? If everybody you were around even now was still talking about, oh, that person, that culture, right, would be one that is disparaging against certain people. So as a leader or as a, a, a participant or a member, right, within that group, you have the opportunity to influence that culture, right, and to change it. Um, the second thing I think is so, so key is the coalition. It's the people that you have around you, right? So back to, you know, how our beliefs and attitudes are formed, right, based on people that are around us. So if you, you know, take that into the way to help change, not suck, the way to help advance things is to really have a coalition of people. And that coalition of people is going to be advisors, it's going to be activists, it's going to be friends, it's going to be co-conspirators, you know, but everybody is on that same page, right? And, and understanding, hey, this is the direction, you know, that we need to head in. The third thing that I think is key is making sure that you have the capacity, right? Meaning the resources, the space, the bandwidth, the tools, the things, right? That help to make change happen. So, you know, I've been in technology for, you know, over 30 years. And a lot of times what I found in technology projects is people say, okay, well, is the system ready? Okay, the system might be ready, 
But what about the people running the system? What about the systems that are connected to that system? What about the overarching infrastructure that that system is part of? So the people who are working on this change that we're expecting, well, now that it's summertime, have we looked at vacation and PTO schedules to see are people really going to even be available to make this happen? Have we looked at the other projects and the other you know, pieces of work that are in play right, to see if people will really have the time and, and space to do it? That is a key thing because a lot of times, you know, people say, oh, well, we want to implement this new change, but then you don't have any of the pieces put together to do it. With capacity, I like to think of a, a, an example, sometimes like a personal one. So for example, I have been, I would say probably since COVID, struggling with sleeping and getting on like a regular sleep schedule where I'm going to bed and waking up around about the same time. But no, some days I stay up until 2 a.m. Sometimes I go to bed at 9.30. And if I think about like all of the, the bigger pieces that help to contribute me being able to go to bed on time and get up on time, it's a whole bunch of things around that. So if I'm doing a whole lot of work in one day and I'm spending time on different pieces, I may run out of time and I might not be able to get something else done. So then I might sacrifice sleep for it. Right. So it's a way to think about it, you know, in a, a, a holistic kind of a way. So you want to have the right culture. You want to have a coalition of people. You want to make sure the capacity is in place. And then you need to make sure that you're on your game and you know what you're doing. So you have to have comp competence. So in order to get competence, right, you have to learn, you have to study, you have to read, you have to practice, and you have to keep on trying over and over again. And I think that that's another muscle, right, that we use, right? So in addition to that, right, once you have the, the competence, right, then you know that you have the tools and you have what you need, then you can really be convicted in, okay, yes, I'm going to take this change forward and I know that I'm going to move with it, right? And you know, because you have all of those other things in place. You talked about courage earlier. That is one of the key pieces when you're talking about change, right? Is really having the courage to make that change, whatever it is. And as a leader, having the courage to help people understand, hey, this might not be something that you like. It might not feel good right away, but it's important. And so that's why. And then, you know, finally, it's really being committed, right? To making that change and saying, yes, I am absolutely going to do this and just putting in that work to make it happen. I love it. And I love how you have kind of these seven commandments of leading change that, you know, it's a process that anybody can follow. And I'm going to say, I say this a lot in my, in the courses that I teach and, and the talks that I give, right? I can tell you all this and it's simple, but it's not easy, right? It's simple. You can say, oh yeah, that all makes sense. But then when you actually sit down to do it or you step up to do it, you know, which is more likely the case, right? Yep. It's not easy. So if people need help, Vonda, either leading a change, initiating a change, or just getting their head right around change, how can they reach you to get some help? So, you know, literally they can just either find me on LinkedIn, Vonda Page 03, or just go to radicalchangellc.com or vondapage.com and, and reach out. You know, I think it's super important that people learn to lead change and then it doesn't have to suck. And like I said, there's some simple strategies and skills and, you know, it really starts with asking some questions, right? It starts with learning and that's where it all begins. And so, um, yeah. And I can't help but think, my gosh, it would be wonderful if all of this were in a book somewhere that I could just read about it. Please tell me you've got a book coming out. I totally do. And the name of my book is Change Doesn't Have to Suck, The No BS Guide to Getting It Right. And in the book, you know, I really dive into the seven certainties of change. I really dive into the three key leadership characteristics of authenticity, curiosity, and empathy. And I really do get into, you know, what does leveling up look like from a change perspective? And it looks like doing things differently. It looks like changing your beliefs, intentions, attitudes, and self-view so that you can actually see significant change, you can actually innovate, and you can achieve more. I cannot wait to read this book. I asked about it because I want to remind Vonda that I'm sitting here waiting to read her book. <laughs> so. And you should be able to do so by September 1st. 
Excellent. All right. So everybody's going to rush out and get your book in September. Maybe we can have you back uh, to talk about your book launch a little bit once it's out. And, uh, you know, you can let folks know at that time where they can find it and all of that good stuff. But I guarantee it'll be on Amazon because everybody's book is on Amazon. Uh, (laughs) Absolutely. uh, And probably everywhere else you can buy books. Vonda, thank you so much for your time today. You are welcome on this show anytime at all, mostly selfishly because I love talking to you, but I'm sure that uh, our listeners love hearing what you have to say as well. Well, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. And, you know, like I said, I I want people to really understand and know that change doesn't have to suck and change and innovation are linked together. And, you know, innovation changes everything, right? And so when we learn, when we lead, when we innovate, we can really make a difference. So thanks again, Amy, for having me and look forward to talking with you soon. Living Corporate is brought to you by The Break Room. Have you ever felt burnt out, depressed, or otherwise exhausted by being one of the onlys at work? You know what I'm talking about. Hosted by black psychologists, psychiatrists, and PhDs, The Break Room is a live weekly web show in the Living Corporate Network that discusses mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. Name another weekly show explicitly focused on mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. I'll wait. This is why you got to check out The Break Room, airing every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on livingcorporate.tv. Living Corporate is brought to you by The Break Room. Have you ever felt burnt out, depressed, or otherwise exhausted by being one of the onlys at work? You know what I'm talking about. Hosted by black psychologists, psychiatrists, and PhDs, The Break Room is a live weekly web show in the Living Corporate Network that discusses mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. Name another weekly show explicitly focused on mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. I'll wait. This is why you got to check out The Break Room, airing every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on livingcorporate.tv. Living Corporate is brought to you by The Break Room. Have you ever felt burnt out, depressed, or otherwise exhausted by being one of the onlys at work? You know what I'm talking about. Hosted by black psychologists, psychiatrists, and PhDs, The Break Room is a live weekly web show in the Living Corporate Network that discusses mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. Name another weekly show explicitly focused on mental health, wellness, and healing for black folks at work. I'll wait. This is why you got to check out The Break Room, airing every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time on livingcorporate.tv. It's always such a pleasure to talk to Vonda. I learn something new every single time I talk to her, and I find that she is just so easy to talk to. What I love about this interview is the passion that she has for helping people embrace and, you know, really lead change. Um, And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Living Corporate and share us with your friends and colleagues. And hey, you can really help us out by leaving us a six-star review wherever you get your podcasts. Maybe you're new here and you're thinking, Amy, there are only five stars. Well, give us all those stars. But then go the next step by leaving a couple of sentences in your own words, telling us what you liked about the episode, the guest, or the show. Don't forget to visit living-corporate.com to learn more about our other podcasts, videos, web shows, and more. See It To Be It is brought to you in part by Lead At Any Level, a certified woman and LGBTQ-owned business dedicated to helping organizations turn their reclusive nerds into inclusive leaders. Lead at any level. Leaders can be anywhere and should be everywhere. Learn more at leadatanylevel.com. That's it for this episode of See It To Be It. This is Amy C. Wanninger, and I'll see you next week. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.